will remain seated as we listen to hymn number two, based on Psalm 100, number two, before Jehovah's awesome throne, you nations bow with sacred joy, know that the Lord is God alone, he can create and he destroy, number two. reading from the word of God this morning comes from the first epistle of Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll begin our reading at verse 11. One Peter chapter 2 and we'll begin our reading at verse 11. Let us hear Almighty God speak. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, 
that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice but as servants of God honor all people love the brotherhood fear God honor the king servants be submissive to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle but also to the harsh for this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief suffering wrongfully for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently but when you do good and suffer for it you take it patiently this is commendable before God for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin nor was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed for you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls likewise you wives be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear do not let your beauty be the outward adorning of a range in the hair or of wearing gold or putting on fine apparel but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God for in this manner in former times the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror likewise you husbands dwell with them with understanding giving honour to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered Amen God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Eternal and almighty God, we come and bow in your most awesome presence. O great creator, great maker of the universe who spoke and it was done we bow before your holy presence and draw near acknowledging that you are the great and eternal God we thank you that you are infinite and eternal and unchangeable in your being wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. And we acknowledge that we all have to do with you. We all have to stand before your great presence because you have formed us. You know our frame. When we were in our mother's womb, you knew us. You knitted us together. All our days are in your hands. You sustain us, our every breath or every movement is all because of your power and sustaining hand 
And we acknowledge, O oh God, that you are great and you are awesome. And that we, as mere uh, creatures, mere uh, dust of the earth, are but as a grain in your hand. And Lord, that by the word of your power you sustain us, but you could crush us at the very same time. Yet we thank you that because of your mercy that we stand here today. Uh, we come on this day, this first day of the week, with gladness. Um, remembering that this is the day that you have made. And we ask that you would cause our hearts to rejoice and to be glad in it. And we thank you that this is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the cross bore our sins in his own body to the tree all away, and was buried but this day he rose again and we thank you that he now lives the risen saviour at your right hand and ever lives to make intercession for us and so because of that fact we can come this morning and we do come with humble confidence resting trusting in the merits of jesus christ we thank you that you are a god of love that you are love and you so loved this world that you gave Jesus Christ your only son to come into this world. That whosoever of us believes on him will not perish but shall have everlasting life. And we come with thankfulness that you have remembered us. That you have delighted in mercy. That you have sent your very son into this world to be the propitiation for our sins we thank you that he became that wrath removing sacrifice upon calvary's cross and we come with hearts of thankfulness that there we have obtained forgiveness of sins there we have obtained a righteous standing before you we are declared righteous because of the lord jesus christ and we come with thankfulness we delight that we may cry out now abba father because we have been brought nigh by his blood we've been brought and drawn into the family of the living god and we bless you that we may bring all our requests all our needs before you and our greatest need lord god is for forgiveness of sins and peace with you and so we confess before you the sins of even this past these past hours these past days, this past week, knowing that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses us from all sins. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ is powerful that it has atoned once for all. It's paid the debt, paid the price for the guilt, the punishment, the shame of our sins. We thank you for such an all-sufficient Saviour in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come this morning, we gather around your word, we come conscious that this gathering perhaps is not like we have known in the past, but yet we are thankful because where two or three are gathered, we know that you are here in the midst. And we would covet your presence this morning as we come to your word. Speak, O oh Father, we pray, into our hearts, into our lives. We pray that in mercy and grace, your spirit may come and apply to our minds and to our hearts and to our stubborn wills the word of the living God. We pray that we may know your presence with us, your convicting power of sin and of judgment and of righteousness, and that we would see Jesus Christ, behold his beauty, behold his wonder, see something of his majesty as these pages of scripture are opened. And Lord, we would pray for those who are absent from the physical gathering with us, but perhaps listening today or gathered at home pray that you would draw near to them we thank you for your promises that you will never leave nor forsake your people we thank you that you hold us fast we thank you that 
we who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and pray for every believer who comes into the sound of your word today that we would find that secret place, we would know that shelter under your wings, and find refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. We commend before you those who are strangers to you and to your grace, and ask in your mercy, Lord God, that you would save sinners this day. We thank you that you are the God of salvation, that today is the day of salvation, that whoever believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. We thank you for this eternal good news, this gospel truth that rings throughout the ages, um, is applicable to men and women and boys and girls of every tribe and tongue and nation of every age of time and pray that even today in this place or as your word is listened to that you would be pleased to save make your arm of salvation of strength known we pray uh, in this area throughout the valleys throughout the cities of wales throughout the nations we pray, O oh Father God, during this, these times that you would have mercy upon us. O oh Lord God, we uh, confess that we have strayed as your very own people. We are not what we ought to be, and as a nation, as a land. O oh Father God, have mercy upon us, we cry. Have mercy upon Wales. Have mercy upon England. Have mercy upon Scotland. Have mercy upon Ireland. Have mercy upon this whole world, we pray. And we come knowing that you are a God of mercy and that you have manifested your mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ and upon Calvary's mountain uh, where justice and mercy met in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we pray that Jesus Christ again would be known and loved and worshipped in our land. Um, we pray for um, a mighty outpouring, a powerful working of your spirit. We acknowledge that we have made your word void, um, but we pray, Lord God, it's time for you to work. Have mercy upon us, we cry. And so as we come with our needs, we pray for our land, we pray for our government, we pray for the coming days that during these strange times and time of virus, times of uncertainty, that we know all things are certain and all things are in your hands. We thank you that you are the Lord God omnipotent who reigns. And we come with gladness and thankfulness that all our times are in your hands, all events at your command. And therefore we rest in your word, we rest in your providence, and we thank you that you are the great and sovereign God who reigns over all things. We commend our hearts to you, therefore, as we come to your word. However, we come and gather this morning as your people. If our hearts um, are full of joy, we pray that you would maintain and cause that joy to burn deep within the soul. If our hearts are perhaps indifferent or cold, we pray that upon the altars of our hearts you would ignite that flame of sacred love and cause us to adore the Lord Jesus Christ um, more fully and more wonderfully. Um, and those sweet hours we once enjoyed when first we knew the Lord, we pray that we would know those yet again. Uh, for the, the distant heart, perhaps the backslider here, we pray, O oh Lord God, that you would cause them in grace to come to themselves and to come to you, uh, knowing that you are the Father who is the Father of compassion and of all grace. And pray that the Lord Jesus Christ, his words would come to them, to come to him, all your weary and heavy laden, and that you would give them rest. Um, they would take the, your yoke upon them and they would learn of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and pray for those who are physically unwell and perhaps struggling to 
uh, focus their attentions upon your word because of perhaps pain or ill health. We pray that you would strengthen and uphold them. We thank you that your grace is sufficient and your strength is made perfect in weakness. And we would ask that you would help each one of us to come to your word and cling to these promises, to trust in them and to claim them and to prove that you are our God. So therefore have mercy upon us, we pray. Uh, speak to us through your word and cause us to leave this house this morning rejoicing that we know that you are our God um, and that this house has been a house of prayer, a house of praise and a house where the Lord Jesus Christ himself has been made known to us. Bless us therefore we pray and bless your church throughout this land as it gathers today in different ways uh, that your name may be honoured and glorified and all the praise and honour would be to the Lamb that sits upon the throne. And until that day, pray that you would keep us. We thank you for keeping grace over many years and pray that you would keep us all the way until we cross that river. And Lord, we long for that day when without sin, we shall praise you as we ought. And we'll gather with all the saints across the crystal sea and around the throne. And we will cry out, worthy is the lamb that was slain for our sins, and honour and blessing and might be unto his eternal and glorious name. And pray that he would be honoured even now in this place, for his name's sake. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you again this morning, and thank you for your warm welcome. Um, my text this morning is taken from the passage which we read, um, 1 Peter, and chapter 2, and verse 25. 1 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 25. For you were like sheep going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now we have here, of course, don't we, the first letter of the Apostle Peter. Uh, written to early Christians scattered from Jerusalem um, in five uh, provinces in chapter 1 verse 1 Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia um, these were believers who knew various trials um, and difficulties and we read that don't we in verse uh, 6 of chapter 1 uh, Peter writes, in this, you, uh, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Um, they were Christians who knew what it was to suffer and be persecuted for Christ's name's sake. However, Peter's writing to them to remind them of their, their heavenly hope, the heavenly blessings that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, of their inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven for them. And there are three main sections, really, in this letter that Peter deals with. The first is the, the heavenly blessings of salvation. Uh, the second is all about Christian relationships. Um, and the third, and Peter will deal quite extensively, is about the sufferings of believers. And our text um, is found in the section which we read, which relates to the conduct of believers, notably their relationships to others, um, whether to government, uh, slaves to masters, husbands and wives and so on. And Peter is writing about these relationships 
um, serving and submitting to others, even in the midst of suffering. Um, he refers, doesn't he, in verse 18 to harsh masters. Um, and in chapter 3, verse 1, wives with unbelieving husbands. So he's dealing with Christians serving and submitting to others for the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the midst of difficulties. And furthermore, Peter actually says, doesn't he, in verse 21, that the Christian is called to suffer. Um, for to this you were called, he writes, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, suffered in our stead, in our place, for us. So we should be prepared to suffer for him, Peter writes. Um, and in the following verses, he writes about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Um, after verse 21. And then he comes to our text, verse 25. And in essence, our text is a summary, isn't it, of the gospel. Um, and he's using this well-known picture of the shepherd and his sheep. And you may well ask, well, why is Peter reminding these Christians of the gospel in the midst of this section on uh, serving, submitting, suffering for Christ? Well, many Christians make the mistake of thinking the gospel is just for non-Christians. It is not. It is not, is it? The gospel is for the believer, for the believer. Um, and Peter very much shows this. He begins our text with the little word for. It means because or remember. And Peter is saying, remember the gospel. Uh, remember what you were. Remember by God's grace what you have become. Uh, let this be your joy. Let this be your delight. And the basis on which you are able to serve Christ, even in difficulties. Um, dear friends, I, I hope that you and I have not lost something of the wonder, the joy, the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really should be the spring in our step, um, that the heartbeat of our Christian life if we're to be useful in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom, um, to know joy and peace as we serve our Saviour, even in trials, Peter is saying, forget not the gospel. Um, let it be the driving power, the, the basis in all that we seek to do. So as we look at this verse, um, the very heart of the matter, may we be refreshed and encouraged uh, may our hearts be filled with joy. And Peter draws our attention to three aspects here. And the first truth is this. It's the wandering sheep. The wandering sheep. For you were like sheep going astray. For you were like sheep going astray. Um, of course, this reminds us of Isaiah's words there in Isaiah 53 verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him that is Christ the iniquity of us all the Christian was like a wandering sheep going astray um, a few years ago, I had to travel from Cardiff up to Port Marion on the northwest coast of Wales. To do that, I had to travel all the way through mid Wales, sort of diagonally across, and I'd never done that journey before. And at some points, I came to very, very narrow roads, lanes, and I thought I was going up driveways at times. I thought, am I going the right way? And I'd go along, and there were sheep in my way. and. Being from the city, I wasn't so sure how to deal with them, really. I got near the sheep, and they just would not move at all, despite the car coming towards them. 
um, but they were wandering. They were off. They seemed to be off the track, um, and really, they seemed to have no sense of belonging. They were going their own way. You could say they were silly, stupid. Um, danger was coming, right in their face, um, but they had no sense of danger. And Peter is saying we were like that. We were stupid, perverse, foolish, wandering from the fold of God. Um, we had gone and turned everyone to our own way, far, far from God, uh, far from his perfect law. I think in Romans 3, one of the key chapters perhaps of understanding scripture, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. And such were we, weren't we? Lost sheep, lost from his way, with no ability to seek after God. It could be said of us, destruction and misery are in their ways. Romans three sixteen. And uh, Peter is saying that, that the Christian was sinful under God's judgment, wandering far from him. Um, a well-known verse, isn't it? Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short or come short of the glory of God. Um, if you've ever played Skittles, uh, if you're anything like me, the, the ball, it goes right off track. It goes nowhere near the Skittles. Um, it's like that, the glory of God. And we all go off track. We all miss the mark. Or if you played archery, you try and get um, the arrow straight on, but it goes off to the side. We've all missed the mark, the glory of God. I wonder if it saddens you when you see people caught up in the world. Um, perhaps you drive through town, or I know in Cardiff, if you've driven through late at night, you see people um, going off, trying to find pleasure and satisfaction in the world. And like lost sheep going astray, um, you think of the hymn, Jesus is seeking the wanderers yet. Why do they roam? Why do they roam? And here is the picture so clearly, people wandering, seeking their own way, um, wandering far from God. See, God has given us freedom of choice, hasn't he, to, to do what we like. Where my parents live in Cardiff, a few years ago, somebody had a pet sheep. I think they found him, he was straying. Um, maybe in Newport, and he became quite a feature in the area of Cardiff where they lived. And they took him in, and they made... I think a sort of kennel for him with carpet and a television and a bit over the top perhaps. But you'd often see them taking the sheep for a walk around the area on a lead. I've never seen a sheep on a lead before. And really God has given us free will, but he calls us to follow and honour him. The oldest song, isn't it? in the world is not the one from the last century. I did it my way. It goes back to the beginning of time, to the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve. I did it my way, not God's way. Sin, sin. Um, and Peter is saying, such were you. Instead of honouring God, we've honoured ourselves. Instead of loving God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we love ourselves. And Peter is saying, such were you, sheep without a shepherd. And I don't know, maybe you were like uh, people in the world, fully immersed in things, in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Or maybe you were a very religious person. But either way, you were wandering in the paths of unrighteousness under God's judgment, carrying the guilt, the burden of sin. Uh, lost sheep, almost on a cliff edge, 
um, in danger of falling off that ledge into eternal destruction, the wandering sheep. The second truth here that Peter reminds us of is the work of salvation. The work of salvation. Now there's a lovely little word in that verse that introduces this whole second point to us. Um, it's only a small word, yet it's very significant. Uh, it's a word of grace. And we must give thanks to God that this word is in Scripture. Can you see it? But, but have now returned. But, you see, we could have been left with us wandering. But shows the grace and the love and the kindness of God, uh, the work of salvation. And this idea, this whole picture of saying what the Christian was, and then using the word but, and moving to what the Christian has become, it's used on several occasions in the New Testament. And, of course, a well-known verse is in Ephesians, isn't it? well-known passage there. Ephesians chapter 2. I read the verses, the opening verses. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Tremendous words, isn't it? But God, my friends, but God. Isn't this the essence of our salvation? But God, but God. Speaking to a lady, believer in West Wales earlier this year, she came up to me, she said, you know, the two words that have kept me through all these years, she said from scripture, but God, but God. And that's true, isn't it? Where would we be without the grace and the kindness and the love of God? Salvation is of the Lord, isn't it? It's but God because he is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, the work of salvation is all of God's rich mercy, of his great love. And they combine together his mercy and love to map out this work of salvation. But you might say, if you're looking at our text, well, it mentions nothing of God. It says, but have now returned. You say, well, surely that suggests something of our work, our effort. Well, we must remember the picture that Peter has painted here. It's of a shepherd and a sheep. And I think you'll agree it's absolutely absurd, um, impossible to suggest that a, a stupid, foolish, wandering sheep could possibly find its way all the way back to a shepherd. No, 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 the shepherd himself must take the initiative. He himself must go to find, to seek out the sheep. And you see the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's all of us. I wonder how you react if you get lost in a car. As you go to an unfamiliar place. If it's the man who's driving, usually puts his foot down a little bit more and drives along. So we'll get there in a minute. And the lady in the front often says, well, let's stop and ask this woman on the left. We need uh, to be found if we're lost in a city. Um, I remember hearing about a missionary who was lost in, 
Vienna. She was travelling back across some Eastern Europe. And she was so lost, she didn't, she was exhausted. And a car pulled up next to her. She'd been praying and said, I'll take you to where you need to be tonight. And she was led to the place where she was to be. She's, she's found um, and taken uh, to a place of rest for the night. The Lord Jesus Christ needs to come and find us in our lost condition. We cannot find ourselves when we are lost. A few years ago when I lived in a different part um, of the UK in Chester, um, when I was working elsewhere, um, I was in an apartment block and I was on the top floor and I used to have to take my rubbish down to these huge bins outside, you may have seen them in the storage bins, so huge you can get in them. And one evening I was taking my rubbish down, I thought well at the same time I'll get my post out from downstairs. Um, so I got to the bottom of the apartment. I had a little key with me that would open the letterbox to get my post. Well, I thought, I'll take the rubbish out first. I went in the dark bin room, these huge bins, I had the rubbish in my hand, and I was silly. I had the key in the same hand as well. And as I threw the rubbish in, this tiny key I threw into this massive bin as well. And it was a dark room, so in went the rubbish, in went the key, and it was lost. I thought, well, I've got no choice, I need to find the key. So I had to go and change, I had to come back with a torch and find a box and climb into this huge, smelly, dirty bin. And I had to take all the rubbish out, bit by bit, with my torch, and the strangest part was a policewoman came past and she came in and she said, oh, have you seen somebody running past? I said, no. She went off. She didn't ask why I was standing in a bin. <laughs> but after a long while, I found the key. I found the key, the shiny key. And, you know, it reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect, holy, glorious, majestic, yet come into this fallen world of sin to seek and to save you and me that which were lost in love, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15 there, the shepherd, what does he do when he found the sheep? Did he lift it by its ear at length? No, he lovingly embraced the sheep by laying it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Perverse and foolish, oft I strayed. But, but, yet in love, in love he sought me. He has lovingly sought foul sinners and carried us back into the fold. Restored by his grace. Christian, can you sing in your heart, O oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold. Wondrous grace that brought me to the fold. What can a sheep do when it's lost? Salvation is all of the Lord, yes. All it can do is bleat. I think that sheep near my parents where they found it is bleating when that, uh, the owners found it. And all we can do is cry out to God, cry out to him. Um, we turn to him, we repent towards God. And we cry out, that's faith, we're trusting, crying, help me Lord, help me, bleat, bleating like a sheep. We return to the shepherd because of his great love for us. Well, what's the third truth? So the wandering sheep, the work of salvation, Third truth from our text here is the watchful shepherd. The watchful shepherd. We've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. <coughs> Peter here gives a twofold description of who we have returned to, the Lord Jesus Christ, shepherd and overseer. Um, if you have the authorised version of the Bible, you'll see it's the shepherd and bishop of your souls. 
And there are various translations of this word overseer, bishop, guardian, superintendent of your souls. The Greek word really is one who watches on or watches over. Um, and so we have this idea of the, the watchful shepherd um, watching over our souls. And you'll be very familiar with the title shepherd given to our Lord. And this can be found throughout scripture and conveys a number of things about his nature. Um, he knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. And that word for know, knowledge, is a, an intimate knowledge um, as to a husband and wife. A marriage relationship he knows his sheep he loves his sheep I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own you know even in trials and difficulties he knows our minds what we're thinking he knows our wills he knows what's on our conscience he knows us he comforts his sheep, doesn't he? He comforts his sheep. Um, perhaps the best known passage in the whole of scripture, certainly the um, well -known, most well-known psalm, Psalm 23. Verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's interesting, isn't it? The rod and the staff, both comfort, chastisement and blessing, both used for the good and comfort of our souls. He leads his sheep, doesn't he? He leads his sheep there again in Psalm 23. The Lord Jesus Christ leading onwards his flock. What do we read? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's always leading us on by his word, by his spirit, bringing his word to our hearts. And he provides for us, doesn't he? provides for every need the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want not want um, all the means of grace isn't it um, and he pours out his love to persevere he gives us wisdom he gives us help um, and whether you've noticed the end of the psalm isn't it related to the Lord providing Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I think it was Peter Jeffrey in his book that described goodness and mercy as sheepdogs following the sheep. And it's like that, isn't it? Your sheep, we tend to wander a bit, but goodness and mercy come and they bring us and lead us and provide for us. And let us always remember that goodness and mercy are two different things. They're not one dog, they're, they're two. Goodness and mercy, they follow us all the days of our life. He feeds his sheep, doesn't he? And this is done by the word of God. Let me ask you, are you feeding upon the word of God? It's the only way you'll grow as a Christian. Um, as soon as you stop reading the word of God... Um, it's like you stop eating physically um, and you become unwell. We need the word of God to feed and nourish us. Isaiah 40 verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd, like a shepherd. But let me say this, we must not forget one of the greatest things about the shepherd. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep a voluntary sacrifice to offer himself without spot and blemish to God verse 24 of 1 Peter 2 tells us who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we 
having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Tremendous, isn't it? There on the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd there, bore our sins, the guilt of our sins, the shame of our sins, the punishment of our sins, all upon the cross. He bore, and he bore them all away. Tremendous work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, he's not just the good shepherd, he's now the great shepherd of the sheep who rose again and lives ever to make intercession for us, for his sheep, for his people. And finally, I'll end with this. Look at the verse again. Return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's a little bit, as you might say, strange, really. I mean, because a shepherd does watch over his sheep. Yet, Peter emphasises as shepherd and overseer, um, or one who watches on or over, as we've said. So Peter's stressing the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is the watchful shepherd. He's the watchful shepherd. He watches over us. Yes, of course, as a, as a sheep, we are to follow the shepherd, follow hard after him. But we're still sheep, aren't we? We're still sheep. The longest psalm, Psalm 119, Psalm of David. I'd never noticed this verse until a couple of years ago. The last verse of that psalm, one, verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. For the Christian, we're saved, we're secure, praise God, but prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. We do fail, we sin, we wander from his paths. Yet the lovely thing is that if we are his sheep, his grace, in his grace he will restore us again. He restores my soul, wonderful truth. And he watches over us, he keeps us. And we can be assured of that. The Lord Jesus Christ said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. You can put a feather on a hand, and you blow, and it'll go off. But if you cover that feather, no matter how hard you blow, that feather is safe and secure. We are his sheep, my friends. We are secure in his hands. Wander we may, but by his grace he will keep us, he will restore us. He will lead us then through the valley of the shadow of death until the glory beyond, when forevermore we shall graze in pastures anew at the feet of the chief shepherd. Friends, great is the gospel of our glorious God. We have a great gospel. We have a glorious God, a kind saviour. May he give us grace to rejoice in this and in the light of this, the joy of it, the wonder of the gospel, then we can serve him even in the midst of trials and sufferings. Will God help us to stray neither to the right nor to the left, but to seek after him, to follow him, to hold fast to his word of grace. 1979, Douglas Macmillan um, preached, didn't he, there on Psalm 23, I believe at the Aberystwyth Conference. Um, and you may have a copy of the book, the transcription of his sermons, perhaps at home. And he says this, I think it's at the very end, he says this. What do you owe? What do you owe? My friends, you owe him everything. You are only a sheep. He is the shepherd. He is 
the shepherd. And I'll read to close a hymn. It's a translation from the Welsh, which a friend recently uh, gave to me. It's about the picture of a, a shepherd and the, the, the sheep. The shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sheep. The gentle shepherd from heaven has come to earth to seek his flock through the vast dreadful desert. His life he gave as an offering in their place and their wandering was avenged on him. From my wandering from paradise he brought me back. Very tenderly he drew me in his bosom. No one knows but he, the great shepherd, how great my wandering from then until now. With his delightful voice he leads me forward. A companion he is in the water and the fire. From every kind of evil in the valley of black death. Who else will be a refuge to me? When I go home to the delightful fold above. I will wander no more away from my dear shepherd. On remembering the journey and all his faithfulness, I will sound his praise to the vault of the heaven of heavens. My husband he is, I will go on after him until coming to the shore from the desert world entirely. My friend thou art, he says to the dust of the earth, and thy God am I for a vast eternity. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. We'll finish by listening to another hymn together. Um, in Christian hymns, it's 709 in New Christian hymns. In tenderness he sought me weary and sick with sin and on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again while angels in his presence sang until the courts of heaven rang oh the love that sought me oh the blood that bought me oh the grace that brought me to the fold wondrous grace that brought me to the fold <laughs>
Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 